before we get into everything, just a little bit of an introduction. Uh, so my name is Wesley Chin. I'm a certified flying instructor over here at the Princeton Flying School. Uh, I've been teaching here since October of 2020. I also did all of my uh, training at Princeton, so private, instrument, commercial CFI, all done in you know, the airplanes here. Uh, when I'm not flying, I'm currently in my third year at the Rutgers Business School studying finance. I'm also minoring in music. In my free time, I like to also play saxophone and piano over there. All right, so let me change the sharing now. Um, we're gonna share the iPad screen, so just bear with me for a second. And also, if we didn't mention before, um, you guys can definitely pull up for flight on your device, whether that's an iPhone, iPad, so you guys can kind of follow along here as well. But you should be able to see uh, my iPad over here. Let me know if this is working. All right, I got a nod from Andrew Bird, very good. Okay, so we'll start off over here. I'm actually gonna shut off the video that's on my laptop, so you won't see my screen just because the connection is getting a little bit laggy. Just give me one second. Okay, very good. So we'll be taking a look at all the different tabs on the tab bar, which is on the bottom of ForeFlight over here. Um, but when you download the app and open it for the first time, it's probably going to look something like this over here. You know, we open on the map tabs, basically. Uh, but we're going to take a look on the left. We have the airports tab, so that's where we're going to start. So the airports tab allows you to search up um, any different airport you want and get a lot of different information about it. So the top portion will give you an overview of the airport and the bottom portion will break it down into five additional tabs with um, more categories of information there. So for example, we can search up any airport on the top search bar over here. So why don't I look up Trenton? Um, so KTTN, press go over there and that'll take us to Trenton. All right, so we'll start off with the top overview section over here. So some of the information we see on top left, there's a little thumbnail of the airport diagram. Uh, we know that this is KTTN Trenton Mercer. You've got the uh, location of the airport. So you basically tell in this the, uh, state and country, Latin long. You've also got the sunrise and sunset times. And next, we've got these uh, two columns of data as well. So latest weather is VFR, and the way we know it's VFR, ForeFlight is actually taking the current METAR that's being published for Trenton Mercer and interpreting if it's VFR, um, if it's marginal VFR, IFR, or low IFR, for example. And you also have the winds, visibility, and any clouds over there. We've got the field elevation, uh, pattern altitude, any fuel services, procedures at the airport, so there's all of your approaches that are available. And on the right side are the most common frequencies that you're going to have to use at this airport. So, for example, you've got your um, you've got clearance delivery, ground, tower, and also approach and departure. So that's what you can find really in the top overview section. But on the bottom, you've got five separate tabs, which a lot, a lot of other stuff. Um, so we're going to start off with this one over here, the info tab. So similarly, it's gonna start off with frequencies, just more in detail actually. So we only had five above, but we're gonna have a lot of other different frequencies we can take a look at over here. So for example, the first one is the weather and advisory frequency, right? So you've got even the phone number you can call for ASOS or ATIS over there, clearance, ground, tower, um, you've got a CTAP and Unicom as well. But if you want to take a look at the direct source for all this information, the next category is gonna be the chart supplement. So if you tap on the AFD button over here, ForeFlight will automatically open up the page of the chart supplement for this airport. So you can kind of take a look at the raw data. So here's Trent Mercer, exactly how it would appear if you've got a hard copy um, green book for your chart supplement. So I'll take it back to the airports page. Um, you've got a nearby airport section and you can sort that based on airports uh, that are actually reporting weather and airports all overall. So let me get back to uh, Trenton over here. All right, and on the bottom, we've got a detail section. So stuff that doesn't necessarily directly apply to the flight itself, uh, but maybe operating hours or anybody to contact at the airport. So if we look at Princeton, you would see Ken over here. Um, and on the bottom, you've got different services. So again, after you get your certificate and everything, when you're flying around, you may need a car, some kind of lodging, see what restaurants are nearby. Another good spot to do it is right here in the info section um, on the airports tab. So moving on to the second tab is going to be weather. Um, this is something that you'll be spending a lot of time looking at, actually. And the first category is going to be your METAR, right? Your current observation for Trenton. So on the right side is all of the information about the METAR we can see. So it's telling us Trenton is currently VFR. This METAR was published 20 minutes ago. So that's that blue uh, text on the top, right? 
then there's the METAR um, in plain text, and also they have it decoded if you didn't want to read that. And if you scroll, continuing on the bottom, there's again airports uh, nearby with also their reported weather. Next category is going to be your TAF, the terminal forecast for the airport, right? It's going to be set up very similar. So on the top right, that's telling us uh, when this TAF was published. So this was uh, published 34 minutes ago at 2339 Zulu. And again, there it is in raw text. And on the bottom, ForeFlight will actually decode for you the TAF in a very readable format. As you know, it's broken down into your different time periods. It's actually telling us if it's VFR, marginal, IFR, low VFR, uh, winds, visibility, and so on. So looking at this, doesn't look like we will be flying uh, tomorrow morning. But one other really awesome feature um, that I'm going to bring up that ForeFlight includes is the aviation forecast discussion that's generated by the National Weather Service. Actually, someone, uh, not a computer, there's actually a guy typing this stuff out. So I'm going to press view forecast discussion over here. Um, and there's actually someone typing all this information about you know, the TAF um, in just plain English for you to read. So they're telling us, looks like over here, uh, tomorrow's Thursday, any lingering rain mixes with and changes the snow by 15 zero Atlantic City in Millville. Otherwise, a period of snow which ends from late morning through mid-afternoon from west to east, uh, marginal VFR, IFR conditions, and so on. So they're telling us a lot of additional information that can supplement your TAF already. The other good thing is they're telling us how confident they are about this information. When I see high confidence, I know, all right, I'll probably expect that weather. But at the end of all of this, the statement over here for Thursday, at least, they're telling us low confidence with the timing details. So we'll definitely expect pretty bad weather, but they're not really too sure what the exact times are going to be. So if I pay attention to the TAF, who knows when this low IFR is actually going to be there. It may not be 8 a.m., may not, you know, so... Just uh, looking at that forecast discussion is a good tool in addition to the TAF. Now, the next uh, category over here under the weather, something called the MOZ is your model output statistics. This is generated by ForeFlight, and it's basically their own computer generating something similar to a TAF. Um, again, it's not in any weird computer data, but it's just all laid out for you. They're breaking it down into different time periods, telling if this is VFR or not, the winds, visibility, and so on. The main difference besides the fact that this is generated by ForeFlight is that the forecast period is much longer. So we scroll all the way down. This takes us to expiring on 4 p.m. on Saturday versus a TEF. That's usually going to be only valid for 24 or 30 hours over there. Uh, the main thing to understand, though, is that the MOZ is not going to be your primary uh, source of data when you're looking at a forecast. And they're telling us straight from the bottom over here, the mods should only be used as a supplemental product and never as a substitute for official National Weather Service forecasts. So you want to be using that TAF primarily, and then the model output statistics can sometimes help supplement that data. And pretty soon we'll be taking a look at a little bit of a comparison, um, what seems to be more accurate or not. The last thing I have over here is winds. This is going to be your winds aloft for the airport, broken down into different time periods. And your different altitudes, they will give you the forecasted winds and also the temperatures. And we can scroll all the way down to see uh, future time periods as well. So one other uh, weather category that I actually don't have my iPad because it's a little bit older over here. I do use it on my phone, and you may have it as well, is the daily forecast. Um, so what I'm going to do for that, I've got a couple of screenshots and different explanations on that PowerPoint. So I'm just going to switch the screen sharing back to my uh, computer over here. All right. And here's what the daily forecast will look like in ForeFlight, at least on a mobile device. So again, if you're um, using it on a mobile, we have all the exact same information, uh, same setup. But the daily forecast will actually give you an hour by hour run through, and again, created by ForeFlight, of what the weather conditions will be for uh, several days in the future. Um, so, for example, in the screenshot on the right over there at 8 a.m., they're expecting VFR conditions, 24,000 feet ceilings, 10 statute mile visibility, um, winds 195 at 7, gusting 15, there's your temperature, and so on over there. So, so far, though, we've taken a look at three different forecasts that ForeFlight has to offer for us. The first one was the TAF, right? That's produced by the National Weather Service. But ForeFlight is also giving us two additional tools to look at. That's the model output statistics, and you've got the daily forecast over here. Uh, so the main thing to understand, though, 
tap as your primary tool and you can use these two other four flight forecasts to help supplement the information. Um, but just to kind of compare um, how accurate each one of these guides is. So a couple of days ago, I did a comparison of the TAF and the MOZ just to see what the actual expected conditions were going to be. So on the left side, I've got a screenshot on my phone of the TAF and the MOZ, right? So it looks like at around 11 o'clock a.m., Eastern Standard Time, the TAF was expecting winds 300 at 13, gusting 24, and the clouds are broken at 4,000. And on the screenshot on the left is the model output statistics, right? The MOZ. They're telling us 11 a.m., it's actually going to be 290 at 12, gust 19, but the clouds are broken at 2,500. So that's actually marginal VFR. That's a pretty considerable difference over there. But uh, looks like about 12 hours in the future, it was around you know, 11 a.m. So I decided to take a look at the uh, METAR that Trent was reporting over there. So they're actually telling us the current weather was 320 at 11 gusting 25, and the clouds were overcast at 4,100. So based on that, the TAF was almost spot on. So it was, it was pretty accurate compared to uh, the MOZ, a little bit off with the cloud ceilings, but the uh, winds were somewhere around there. Yesterday, uh, going in today, though, I decided to also include the daily forecast in the comparison. So here's one between the TAF, the model output statistics, and the daily forecast. So just by looking at the winds for each one of these forecast periods, and we're going to call this um, maybe 10 a.m. So the TAF at 10 a.m. was saying winds 210 at 11 gust 19. The MOZ at 10 a.m. was telling us 210 at 12 gust 20 over there. And then the daily forecast at 10 a.m. for Trenton was 206 at 10 gusting to one. So all of that already is pretty close together. So just by looking at all three of those forecasts, I was gonna expect probably almost exactly that. So when 10 a.m. rolled around, it looked to be when 21013 gust 20. So again, that was one scenario where the TAF, MOZ, and daily forecast actually pretty much almost totally agree with each other. Worked out pretty well. Um, but the main thing when you use all these, just remember that TAF should be your primary tool uh, when forecasting, but definitely use that forecast discussion to determine the confidence. Use the MOZ and check out that daily forecast as well to see how accurate everything is gonna be there. All right, so let me go back to my iPad over here so we can continue taking a look at the airports tab. All right, so see here we are again. So moving on from the weather, um, we'll take a look at the runways tab over here. So this will tell you everything about the runways at the airport. Um, so Trenton has two runways there. We've got six, two, four, and then one, six, and three, four. A lot of other information, including the length and width. Um, you've got glide slope indicator, the actual heading, any kind of lighting, elevation. But another cool feature is for a flight, based on the current uh, METAR that's being reported, will actually tell us what runway is best based on the wind. So it's actually telling us runway 24 is best right now. Uh, looks to be about right since winds are 200, only four knots, though. They're telling us there's a crossing component of two knots and the headwind component of four knots, a nice, useful tool. The last thing that I didn't mention on the bottom for each runway, it'll give you the instrument approach procedures, which will lead me into the next tab, all your procedures, right? They break this down into four categories as well, starting with your airports, right? So this is anything to do with the uh, surface diagram. So we'll take a look at the FA airport diagram. All I got to do is tap that and a full screen view of the airport diagram will appear. So I think mine right now is in the dark mode. So that's why the colors are inverted, but you can also change that with the settings over there. Um, going back to the airports, though, the FAA only publishes airport diagrams for so many airports across the U.S. Not every single one is going to have an official FAA airport diagram. Uh, to solve this problem, ForeFlight has decided to create their own custom airport diagrams. So even if we go look at Princeton, which, as we should know, does not have an official FAA airport diagram, they will still publish um, a ForeFlight diagram that we can access from this app. So going back to Princeton over here. If we go to that procedures tab for the airports, here's that airport diagram right, uh, for four flights. So I'll press that over here. So as you can see, this will open up a um, nice full screen view again, give you the runways, the tracks, you've got your uh, lengths and widths of there, but there's nothing labeled for taxiways, which is okay though, so, but still a very useful tool if you're flying to an airport that doesn't have an official FAA diagram, four flight will still publish um, their own version over there. All right, going back to procedures, though, you've also got your departure and arrival procedures and any instrument approaches that you can shoot. And again, just got to press on it and it'll open up full screen in your plates. 
And the last thing to take a look at in the airports view is the NOTAMs over here. So any NOTAMs applicable to the airport. There's airport, obstacle, and TFR, so three different categories. They will break it down. And they will also sort it based on the time period, as you can see on the right side. So any things that was published today, um, any older ones that were published, um, obstacle and TFR. And we can see much more if we're going to Trenton, for example. So I'll go back over there. Here's some NOTAMs for the airport. So any future NOTAMs. So for example, um, the first one that I'm seeing here, taxway Charlie between runway six and two four and one six three four is closed daily between 1300 uh, 20 over there. Um, that's effective starting January 24th at 8 a.m. Eastern. So again, kind of decodes uh, some of the work over there for you. Then the last thing I'll talk about in the airports tab over here. Um, if you're frequently visiting an airport, you can also favorite it using the star button on the top. So if I'll go to Princeton over here, I know I'll probably be visiting that a lot, right? So all I got to do is press the star button and on the top left, I can view my favorite airports over there, any recently browsed, and I can also search over there. So that is the airports tab. Uh, now let's say you've got something you know, searched up on the airports tab and you want to open it up somewhere on a map. So the button on the top right over here, if I press that, We'll open up and center that in what we call the maps tab. So we're going to move on to the maps tab now. This is where most of your time on the four flight app will be spent when you're in the airplane. Um, it's got a lot of different features, but we're going to take a look at it first. Right now, you're probably wondering, doesn't look too useful um, if you're going to be flying an airplane. I don't really see anything that helps me. So what you've got to do, you've actually got to add different charts and layers onto the map if you want to see aeronautical information over here. So on the top left, we've got this layer and chart selector. So I'm going to tap that over there. On the left side are different charts that you can add onto the map. And on the right side are different layers that you can also implement. For example, you can implement the radar and the RMS and SIGMETs, TFRs. Um, so we're going to take a look at that soon. But let's talk about what charts you have to actually apply first. So if we're flying VFR, obviously I want to have the US uh, VFR sectional. So all I have to do is press that over there. And now we'll see the sectional will get loaded up. If I zoom in, that'll be your tack chart. But right now it's your sectional over there. So I'm flying IFR, I could change that as well to one of these low charts, but I'm going to stick with uh, VFR sectional over there. Four flight also offers us a street map and aerial map. You know, it doesn't totally relate to the F flight, but could be kind of fun to take a look at. And one feature that you're not going to find anywhere else but four flight creates something called the aeronautical chart. Uh, the aeronautical chart layer actually highlights specific things that you will find in a sectional chart here. It'll highlight different airspaces, airports, things that you may need to pay attention to, especially. So I'm going to enable the aeronautical chart layer over here. You're going to see some of these things are now highlighted and easier to see. So any airport, I've got different airspaces and nice and easy to read um, ceilings over there as well. I've got towns labeled, different roads, and you can toggle that off of these different buttons on the left side. So these are the airports that I want to have um, different airspaces. I like that highlighted. If I wanted to have all the federal airways highlighted as well, I could press that, but I think that clutters a little bit too much. Additionally, the aeronautical chart uh, layer information will change based on your zoom setting. So again, it's all pinched to zoom. So for example, as I pinch in closer to Princeton, I will actually see the airport diagram uh, being geo-referenced onto the sectional. So there's your runway, there are the different taxiways and everything. As I zoom out, of course, those things are gonna disappear over there. So I would definitely recommend having that aeronautical chart layer selected. Um, very useful interactive tool there. But what we'll do now, we'll take a look back at the layer selector at all these different layers on the right side. Um, so for example, if I wanted to enable the radar, I could press that over here. Um, not sure if there's any precipitation nearby, but if there is, we'll be able to see it on the uh, chart over here. Something else that's important to notice, most of these layers are animated, so you can actually see how they're moving. So like if there is a band of precipitation, I can change the slider back and forth over here. I can even press play to see how that's moving. Um, but also important to me, note, this is not real-time information, right? Uh, right now, it's 727, and the last return from the radar was 720 p.m. over there. So a couple of different layers I also like to have turned on. Um, so traffic, I'll mention that later on, but I do like to also have the air meds and segments layer turned on as well. And you can toggle what kind of air meds and segments that you would like to see on the bottom as well. So I want to have thing, anything about a thunderstorms, IFR conditions, and uh, 
turbulence low over there, for example. I'm not going to care about the others just yet. And now we have a graph, graphical representation of those air mass and sig mass. So over here, all this orange, this area is that turbulence low air mass. And I can actually you know, press anywhere on it to find more information. So now this is your turbulence air met from zero to 8,000 feet and you're expecting moderate turbulence. Um, and it's from 7 p.m. to 9.59 uh, local time over there. So that's usually something I like to keep on as well. And again, it's animated if you wanna see what's in the past and the future there on the bottom. You can also have a layer for TFRs over here. I definitely would recommend having that one turned on. Uh, a couple of days ago around Philly, we had a nice TFR over there. I'm um, looking around. Nothing nearby, but ForeFlight will actually show any upcoming TFRs in orange and any active ones in red. And if you're in the airplane, it will actually send you a little notification if you're approaching an upcoming TFR as well. Another really cool layer that some people don't know too much about is the flight category layer. So the flight category layer is kind of a visual representation of an airport's METAR, but on your maps. All right. So for example, looking at Trenton, there's a green uh, circle over there. That's telling us that the airport is currently VFR. So the flight category, again, you're telling us if it's VFR, maybe marginal, IFR, low IFR. Um, so anything VFR is going to be green. Anything marginal is going to be in blue. IFR is going to be in red. And then low IFR is going to be in magenta. Uh, but just by looking around so far, everything that I see is green. Pretty good weather nearby is what I'm expecting. So this is good to help you see like a you know, big picture view if you're flying somewhere far away. And going back to the layers over here, you can also turn on PIREPS if you wanted to see different pilot reports, what people are saying in the air over there. Um, so those are your layers, all right. Um, but generally these are the ones I personally keep on. So I've always got the VFR sectional aeronautical uh, chart layer as well. And I like to keep on the radar and traffic when I'm in the airplane, but also the air mets, SIGMETs, uh, TFRs, flight category and PIREPS as well. So another really important function of the maps tab, again, it's a lot more than just a sectional chart on an iPad screen. Uh, we can use the maps tab for flight planning, for flight planning. On the top over here, there's an FPL button. I'm gonna select that for flight planning. And it says tap here to create a route. So if I tap this, it'll open up kind of a text box and I can uh, enter in different waypoints. So let's say we're flying from Princeton and doing a cross country out to Reading. Um, so all I've got to do is type in the two identifiers. So 39N, I press space and it's in blue now and recognize that it's an airport and I'll write in writing as well. So KRDG, get that entered in. And now we've got two waypoints. And once those two waypoints are selected on the maps, Forflow will now draw a magenta line between those two uh, waypoints. So similar to your GPS function over here. If you don't want to type in anything on that text box, another thing you can do for flight planning is use touch planning on the map. So you can actually drag the magenta line around to create your own waypoints. So let's say, for example, um, for some reason, you wanted to fly over Sky Manor before you hit Reading. So all I would have to do is drag this magenta line around to somewhere around Sky Manor, doesn't have to be exactly on it, and release my finger. Uh, I think I actually put it over Alexandria over there. Uh, but what will happen is once I release, it'll ask me to insert something into the route. So I could actually insert the lat long location or it'll show any nearby airports or navigation uh, waypoints over there. But I'm gonna select Sky Manor. And now ForeFlight will automatically add that into the route. And you can see that um, as well with the lines on the bottom and also on the top text box, November 40 is now in between Princeton and Reading over there. Uh, you can also drag the waypoints on the text box to rearrange. So maybe you were gonna actually go fly it to Reading first and then uh, go to Sky Manor afterwards. So I could drag Sky Manor just by holding it down, moving it to the right side. So now Sky Manor is gonna be the last checkpoint and the magenta lines and, and flight plan will be rearranged on the map display on the bottom there too. I could also tap each waypoint for additional information. So for example, um, I'll press on Reading over there let's see. I could show it on map with that top left button that'll basically center it on the display. I could just go direct to, so just like your GPS, direct enter, enter. I can remove it from the route totally. I can view any notams. Uh, show any approach plates over there, show the airport diagram or open up like a full screen view of Reading on the airports tab. So another cool function of the uh, text box on the top. But after you enter in all this information, ForeFlight will actually uh, be able to calculate a couple of different things for you. So 
Over here, you've got your distance is 106 nautical miles. Um, you can also calculate estimated time and route, estimated time of arrival, fuel, and also the wind. But in order to calculate all accurate information, we've got to input a couple of different things first. So we'll start off just to the left of the text box of the flight plan. There's three different buttons. Uh, the first one, we've actually got to select an aircraft. I'll tap that over here. Uh, for flight has an aircraft tab that we're going to take a look at after, but there's also um, a system. You've got to add each airplane into the system in order to use it in your flight planning and also when you can follow a flight plan, which we'll talk about later. Um, but what I can do, I can press the plus button on the top to add a new aircraft. So, and certain things I've got to actually enter in. So I would have to enter in the tail number, uh, the aircraft type. I could also enter in things about the glide performance, the fuel, any uh, thing about following the flight plan. But I'm not going to add one over here, so I'm just going to delete that. And for now, I'll just stick with Mike Charlie, which I've selected. Uh, the next thing over here you've got to add is what we call a performance profile. So if you want to know your uh, you know, expected time and route and all this fuel burn and stuff, four flights got to know what your you know, cruise speed and fuel burn is going to be. So you've got to add a performance profile for the airplane and then uh, connect that to the specific tail number of the aircraft. So all you got to do is add basic performance profile. You can fill in all of this stuff. You can even fill in a specific climb airspeed and do a per hour, you know, same thing with descent, but the only two required things is a cruise to airspeed and then cruise fuel per hour. And again, you can find any of these numbers in the airplanes uh, POH. I'll delete this for now though, but I've got one already made for the uh, 172. Something else to mention as well, if you've got like a more advanced subscription of four flight, this is just a basic one, by the way, they will have preset performance profiles for the airplane. Uh, but these are just some sample numbers that I have inputted for the uh, 172R, it looks like, so let me press edit. So again, numbers will all vary, but right now I've got 105 uh, true airspeed and you know nine gallons an hour for the fuel. Third thing we've also got to put in is a cruise altitude. So that's the third thing on the bottom over here. So the really cool feature is that Ford Flight offers you this cruise altitude advisor. So we're gonna be going via far. It already knows that this is gonna be westerly, so you won't have to manually think about that um, neat sweeping acronym over there. And it'll give you all these possible cruising altitudes. Additionally, it'll tell you what your headwind or tailwind component is be, how long it's gonna take, and also the fuel burn. So it's looking like the higher we go, the stronger the headwind is going to be. So I probably don't want to go too high. Um, I could also look for IFR cruising altitudes, go easterly, and can change it like that. But let's say we'll go VFR to Reading. Um, I'll stick with you know 4,500 for now. We'll call it that. So I can select that cruising altitude. Now, if we look on the top right portion, we've got three other buttons over here: procedure, routes, and estimated time of departure. So we've also got to enter in manually an estimated time of departure. Otherwise, Ford Flight doesn't know what weather to use. It doesn't know what you know, winds and law, for example, is going to be. So I'm going to press the ETD button over there. Uh, let's say we're going to be departing at 8.30 p.m. local. So I'm going to get that set in there. All right, let me let go of that. And once I've got that information in, so again, we've got the airplane, the performance profile, got your cruise altitude selected. Uh, you've also got an estimated time of departure. Four flight will now be able to calculate pretty accurate information for you. So if you look again at these metrics, distance obviously is going to stay the same, but now estimated time and route and ETA has changed, right? So it's telling us around 9.41 p.m. should be the estimated time of arrival. We're burning 12 gallons of fuel, and again, there's a 13-knot headwind component over there. Um, another cool feature, though, is you can even add procedures. Um, so let me take a look at this over here on the top right. So the procedures, for example, if I wanted to add an approach into Sky Manor, maybe some kind of different approach, I can do that. But even if you're flying a VFR, Ford Flight can help you figure out these different traffic pattern entries. Oh, so I think my app just crashed over here. Let me get that back open. Uh, but talking about that procedures again, um, if we select the traffic pattern, you can choose what runway you would like to have selected at the destination arrival airport. And Ford Flight will give you different options for the traffic pattern entry. So it'll actually draw and visualize through the 45 entry. It'll draw, you know, crossing midfield and joining down directly or joining the 45 with a teardrop. Uh, so let me try that again here with the procedures. So going to procedures, uh, we'll go traffic pattern for Sky Manor. And it's telling us again, runway 25 is the best runway over here based on the winds, giving us our pattern altitude. So let's take a look what it would look like if it's straight in. It'll draw that out for you over here. 
um, crossing midfield and teardrop. That's the entry it'll draw out. Or if it's a right traffic, it could be 45. So again, this is a very useful tool you can use uh, to help you visualize pattern entries in addition to obviously looking outside using your head indicator and so on. I'll close that out though. And one other thing I'll mention about those uh, performance profiles and everything. Sometimes it can be a hassle to create a performance profile for every single airplane. So there is a quick and dirty method we can use instead of actually adding a performance profile in. So back to this text box on the top for the uh, flight plan function. In addition to waypoints, I can actually enter in an airspeed for cruise and also a fuel burn. So let's say, you know, just rough estimate, we'll be going 110 the whole time as cruise airspeed. So I can type that in and the four flow will now recognize and apply that to the entire route. So I'm doing 110 knots. Um, I could also type in a fuel burn. Let's be super conservative and say, we're gonna be burning 10 gallons an hour the whole route. So 10 GPH, I'll type that in, press enter. And now four flight again recognizes that's gonna be the fuel burn. So based on this information, forward flight will still be able to calculate your fuel burn and the estimated time of arrival. So again, this is a really nice alternate method of adding that performance profile and you know filling out all those you know climb, cruise, and descent uh, information. So this is kind of you know just like if you're doing on paper over here. If you want to make it nice and easy, just enter in a quick uh, climb, uh, sorry, cruise to airspeed, and also an overall fuel burn over there. Something else important to note, everything we've been doing in this flight plan tab has been in the edit section over here. There's also a nav log button, which will give you your calculated headings to fly the fuel burns for each leg, but we'll be taking a look at a uh, more detailed nav log in the next uh, couple of minutes. But once you do all of your flight planning, you get all your you know, times in the cruise altitudes, there's one more thing we've actually got to take a look at and four flights alerting us to it. Uh, if we look at this little suitcase icon in, on the top over here uh, with an exclamation point and a red circle, this is alerting us to the pack function over here. So everything we've been doing is connected to the internet, right? Um, but when I'm flying, I'm not gonna be connected, I'll be offline. So what I can do, I can actually pack for this flight and download the weather, any notums, any diagrams I need onto my device so I can still access it in the air. And before flight is telling us, hey, I haven't done that yet. So I'm gonna press the uh, little suitcase icon over here, see if it works. And now it's telling us to pack for the trip. So I can actually download the weather, AMRATS and SIGMATS, any TFRs, fuel prices, airport notams, all in this one button over here on the bottom right with the pack. So definitely, if you're going to do your planning and everything, make sure you pack for the trip beforehand as you want to do, uh, save this information um, onto your device because once you're in the air, you won't be able to access this since it'll be offline. But if I'm going to close that up, but you know, if you're going to be coming back uh, same route, you can still invert it. So just like your invert flight plan on GPS, um, we can use this button over here to invert. And now it's going to be Sky Manor, Reading, back to Princeton over there. So I'll invert that back. Let's see. All right. So that's the uh, flight plan function of the maps tab. So again, a lot of stuff to take a look at. I'm going to leave that open for now. Something else that's really cool about a, the maps tab that can be very useful for diversion scenarios is using the ruler function, the ruler function. So if I take two fingers and tap on the device at the same time, just like this, four flight can actually draw a line between my two fingers and I can move it around. A lot of information just from this, okay? So I've got my track, I've got the distance already, the time and the fuel burn. Um, there's my airspeed, again, based on everything I've selected beforehand and the track on the uh, opposite way. So very, very useful if you needed to divert to another airport and you didn't have a GPS, for example, you can just use your two fingers like this to quickly estimate um, all this information over there. So going back to the top, though, we talked about the uh, layer and chart selector. We talked about the flight plan function. Um, looking at the settings, there actually are a couple of things I'd like to explore over here. Um, so here's where you can change maybe your auto center mode. So I like to fly north up. You can also change that to track up. Um, I also like to have my extended center lines on, extended center lines. So any airport that I have in the flight plan or anything I entered beforehand for a flight will automatically show the extended center lines of all the runways on the maps. So for example, over here, I see the extended center lines for Sky Manor's runway seven and two five, just like that. Um, same thing with Reading, got two runways, I see the big extended center lines. So I like to keep those on. Um, very useful for you know visualizing the airport layout as you're going towards it and also different pattern entries if you need to. I could also turn on distance rings. 
So based on my current GPS location, ForeFlight will draw these rings around me of different distances, and you can set up what distances you would like in the settings. Um, but if I turn that on and go back to where I am right now, let's see. We can see that it'll actually draw these rings around where I am. So we've got a ring for two miles, four miles, and 10 miles. And of course, um, very useful if needed to report for, you know, to air traffic control for any reason. I'm going to turn those back off. One of the most uh, useful features, I think, I haven't had to use it yet, fortunately, but we have something called the Glide Advisor, the Glide Advisor. So the Glide Advisor can allow us to quickly assess our options if we have some kind of engine failure scenario. Um, and to do that, we've actually got to set up the glide settings. And there's two parameters we've got to input. The first thing is going to be your glide speed, which you can easily find in your POH, and also what we call the glide ratio. Uh, some airplane in the POH may be able to find that pretty easily. Uh, but for example, if we're flying the 172R, there's not something in the POH that actually is going to explicitly tell us what the glide ratio is. Um, so what I'm going to do, I am going to switch back to my PowerPoint. We're going to talk a little bit about this glide ratio and the glide advisor feature. Um, just turn those distance rings off over here. Let's see. All right, and I'll switch back to the uh, presentation. All right, very good. Um, so before talking about the glide ratio, though, here's what the glide advisor feature can look like. So as you're flying along, and again, all based on your GPS location, ForeFlight will draw a little circle or some kind of shape around you of airports or something you can make in case you've got an engine failure scenario. Um, so based on this, I would definitely not be able to make my destination if I saw that. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the uh, glide ratio setting and how to determine all of that. So everything that I've taken a look at so far, your POH will have some kind of uh, glide distance or glide chart. And this is an example of one that we can find in the 172 RRS POH. It's basically just giving us a line uh, based on your height above terrain, your altitude, AGL, right, and then the distance. So according to this graph, for example, the airplane will glide about three miles or so if we're at 2000 feet above the ground. So I'm doing again, I'm strong a line from 2000, meeting the diagonal and going straight down. That's about three nautical miles. So if I, if I convert that to feet, that's about 18,228. Using those two numbers, I can actually figure out that glide ratio. So 18,228 divided by 2000 gives me approximately 9.1. That's the number I would be entering in as the glide ratio. And again, that just means for every 9.1 units traveled, the airplane will lose one unit, and I can call it foot of altitude over there. Most GA airplanes um, that I've looked at so far will have a glide ratio around this value, 9, 9.1, 9 10, 8. Anything around here is usually pretty good. Um, personally, though, this is what I use as, as all my values over there. All right. Um, a couple other things, though, in the functions of the uh, settings for the map. There's also what we call a track vector over here. So for flight, we'll draw a line from your current position um, and we'll show you where we'll be in the next few minutes. And again, you can change the length of the line in your settings. So if I'm going straight over here. I'll be here in X amount of minutes. But even as you turn, for flight will draw for you the uh, radius of the turn there. So it could be a useful feature. Um, something else that I like to use when I'm doing turns around a point or something of that sort, students, is the breadcrumbs feature over here. So as you're flying along, for a flight, we'll just draw a line of your previous flight path and keep it on the map. So if you're doing turns around a point, you want to see how you're doing, this could be a pretty useful tool to see if you're keeping maybe like a constant radius around your point. If you're flying traffic patterns, maybe to see how you're doing with keeping yourself parallel on downwind, for example. But again, all of this is found within that uh, settings button in the maps tab. So let me get back to the iPad now. All right, very good. So we've talked about um, settings again, and I'm going to show you guys what we're just we're looking at so there's a glide advisor i have track vectors turned off but i do keep on the breadcrumbs over there especially when doing some kind of ground reference maneuver right um one other feature that i do like to use over here is actually the instrument panel in for flight so the second one from the last over here so once i have that selected you'll see um looks like six different instruments now appear on the bottom of the map screen 
you can customize each instrument to show different things. So maybe if I didn't want to see the track, I wanted to see on uh, a rate of turn, I could select that over there. Vertical speed, I could select that. Um, but this is just again, a very useful tool to have and also a good backup. Maybe if you know somehow your altimeter fails, this can be a good little estimate. You've also got your track um, over there. All right. And the last thing I'll talk about on the maps page is the top right button. If I press that, that'll just center it to my current location. It'll follow me as I go along the flight. So I don't have to keep uh, trying to find where my airplane is, for example, on the sectional chart there. All right. So that's a lot of stuff, but that's the maps tab. And again, that's probably where you're going to be spending most of your time there. So you do want to you know, get familiar with all the different functions that we've talked about. So moving on, uh, we'll look at the plates tab. So that's the third one on the bottom over here, plates. So what we can do, ForeFlight offers us the option to organize our plates into these little virtual binders. And you can even create a binder for each flight so that everything you need is in one spot and you don't have to go searching for all your different plates in the airports tab. Um, so I can press my plates over here. I'd like to add a new binder. Let's um, call it whatever we want. So let's say Princeton to Reading again, just so I can label it like that save that and now here's my binder for this flight and i can add different plates over here so i'm going to press the add plate button from princeton maybe i wanted to add the four flight airport diagram i don't know why not let's just add all those approaches in there and then for reading i also wanted to add the fa airport diagram any hot spots and again i could continue adding on all those approaches if i wanted to but again, it's just a nice way to organize everything you need for one flight. So you don't have to go looking for everything uh, on the airport tab. But again, it is there as an option. Um, we'll take a look at the airport diagram for Reading over here. Let me see if I can get those plate calls inverted again. Um, but here's what an airport diagram will look like. Um, the one thing that you probably noticed, and let me clear it out, is that you can actually annotate on any of these plates. Probably the most useful tool for annotations, as I was going to explain, is actually going to be for drawing out your taxi route, especially uh, VFR and new private pod and everything. So let's say again, if I was at Millennium FBO over here, I needed to get to, uh, let's say, same example, out, out to runway 18 for departure, and we got our taxi instructions. You can use that annotation tool to help you draw along what your taxi route is going to be and see if we're going to be going through any hot spots, for example. So maybe they told us Alpha Bravo Delta Hotel Cross Runway 13. That's a lot of stuff, but we can just trace along that route over here to see exactly what's going on. Crossing the runway, left on the hotel to be exactly where I need to over there. So that's the uh, plates tab again. Um, so annotating. One other cool thing you may see on the top it says tap to view four notums. Four flight will actually automatically scan for any applicable notums for your selected plate and will warn you of that. So I can tap to see any notums. Um, so I guess something about ice at the airport looks like, yeah, all about the fuel condition, just patchy ice everywhere. So, very useful feature of the plates tab. All right, so next one we've got is the documents tab, and this is going to be set up very similar to the plates tab. So you can also create different virtual binders and everything, but what you've got to do, you've actually got to download documents from ForeFlight's catalog. So there's the top left button over here is catalogs. So I'm going to open that up. ForeFlight has three different drives where you can download from. The first one is the FAA drive. So a couple different things you can download flight plan forms. Um, they also have different folders of stuff. You can, you know, open up chart supplements and download those hard copies, some FARs. But one that I like to look at is the handbooks over here. I'm going to open up the FA handbooks folder. So I could download all my ACSs if I wanted to, you know, have those directly and saved onto the app. I can download my airplane flying handbook. I can download my PHAC. So if I wanted to do my studying and reading and take notes on for flight, you can also do that. So for example, if I open up the PHAC over here, I guess I've got some rendered page. Um, of course, it'll be directly from the FAA. You can scroll through it like this, but you can also search through the book just like if it's a PDF, right? Um, search for text. You also have your table of contents if you wanted to look at specific chapters and you can bookmark certain pages for, for you know, future study. If you also wanted to, you can use the little annotation tool to highlight, take any notes. So again, very useful. And again, it could be kind of a one-stop place if you wanted to be your uh, reading or studying on for flight. So they've also got a four flight drive to download information from, but this is just a lot of stuff about using the app itself. The cool thing though, you can actually also import or download your own documents from, from kind of other source. So what I usually would like to do, I hooked up my um, Google Drive account into here. I was able to download a couple of things. One of them was the uh, kneeboard for the Hudson River. So I like to keep that somewhere in my uh, 
documents uh, over here. Let me see if I can pull that up. But again, that's something we're not going to be able to find within those drives. So here it is. This is just again a PDF that I've downloaded somewhere onto my drive and imported into four flights. So I can also have it there. And again, here's where you can add different binders. I've got a couple ones for previous check rise and you can add new ones if you needed to as well there. So that is the documents tab. Uh, moving on, our fifth tab on the bottom is the imagery tab. Um, so imagery is just gonna be all of your weather charts that come directly from Aviation Weather Center. The four flight's not making any of this by themselves. They're just sorting it out in the next presentable manner, but all these charts come directly from the Aviation Weather Center. So here's national charts, any continental United States weather, including your prog charts there, significant weather outlooks, convective outlooks, uh, graphical aviation forecasts. So you've got your uh, cloud forecast. You've also got your surface analysis and other different charts if you need it. Winds aloft, graphical air mess and sig mess you can take a look at. But again, all of this is created by uh, Aviation Weather Center, and you're going to see some of this stuff has their little mark on the bottom over there. However, when you're going to be doing a uh, you know flight planning and everything, you're going to be spending time on the flights tab. So we're going to take a look at the flights tab now. So there's two big functions of the flights tab. The first one is going to be for flight planning and filing a flight plan. We also talked about the maps tab before, and we'll connect that to this. But the second big function that a lot of people also don't take advantage of is the weather briefing. Um, so you can actually get your graphical weather briefing from ForeFlight over here. So we're going to take a look at that. But just by opening up the, the uh, flights tab over here on the left side, we're going to have all your past flights you've you know planned out and filed if you needed to. Uh, but what we're going to do, we're going to add a new float over here. So I'm going to press the plus button and a new flight uh, will open. And on the right side will be a bunch of different things for us to fill out. It's going to be very similar to what we did on the maps tab over here. Um, so I could fill in an estimated time of departure. And again, let's let's kind of stick with that same scenario of departing at 830 over here. Um, and the departure we'll say is going to be Princeton, I guess I've done that in the past couple of times. Um, we're going to Reading, and we're just going to keep it direct like that. Here's where I'd have to select that specific aircraft again and the performance profile, and it's all set up from, from before. Uh, flight rules, we're going to stick to VFR over here. The route, I could add any, any waypoints if I needed to. And I've got their same cruise altitude advisor, so I'm going to stick with 4,500 feet over here destination services and there's that pack button that appears again so i can download all this information onto the device so when i'm flying um, it doesn't disappear and if i needed to file the flight plan after i'll just press to proceed to file or if i will automatically translate everything you just entered in into one of those flight plan forms you can edit it as necessary and then press file so that's it over there um, so what you can do though we've so far have talked about two ways to do flight planning on the map and also on the uh, flights tab over here. It's actually interchangeable though. So let's say you do all your planning on the maps tab. You know, we dragged our waypoints around, entered in all the performance data times and all that. And I wanted to file it. So what I can do actually using this uh, button over here, I can send this to different places. And one of them I can send it to is the flights tab. So I got to press flights. And now ForeFlow will automatically generate a new flight and fill in everything we just had from before. So there's the same stuff, your time departure, de um, departure, destination, the airplane, uh, flight rules, cruising altitude, and everything we just saw from before. And I can just continue filing from here. Now, the other scenario is, let's say if we do your flight planning on the flights tab over here, and I want to get that to the map, I can do the same thing. On the top right, there's the send to button. I send this exact same thing to the map. I should be able to see my Princeton to Reading departing at whatever time I had selected and the altitudes in the airplane. So another cool feature, again, you can do planning on uh, any one of those here. But I would say that uh, the flight tab over here is going to offer some additional benefits. So one of them is that uh, for flight can actually generate its own navigation log. So we're going to press the nav log button over here. We'll let it do its thing and calculate all of its stuff. But just like paper nav log, we've got all of our information right here. So you've got your different waypoints, the different magnetic headings, courses, altitudes, uh, winds aloft and temperatures, different speeds, your time and route, fuel burn, all that stuff is gonna be there. And on the bottom, you've also got all your necessary frequencies you may need and your airport diagrams. So again, really cool that it can generate a nav log for you. Something else that ForeFlight can generate 
is a graphical weather briefing. So when we're gonna take a look at this over here, this is the briefing button. It may take just a couple of seconds for ForeFlight to gather all of the information. But basically what it's doing is ForeFlight is generating a standard briefing, just like you would get from 1-800-WX-BRIEF, but they're just presenting it in a more you know, fancy manner, if you wanna call it like that. But if we look at the contents of the briefing, it's gonna be in the same uh, order as you would get if you call the briefer or do it online with 1-800-WX-BRIEF. It'll start with any adverse conditions before going into synopsis and current weather, then forecasts, and then finally notums. And ForeFlight will also mark that you've read your sections and you can tell if you haven't read it or not with that little you know, orange uh, dot there. So taking a look, for example, a um, bunch of uh, IFR air mats over here that they're telling us, nice and easy to read. There's the raw text, but they also decode it for you what the times are, and it'll tell you if it's active during your passing time, near or not at all. So very useful to kind of filter out what you have to look at as well. And you can continue on going to the next sections that's just like this over here. All the same stuff that you would get um, if you call the briefer or do it on 1-800-WXBRIEF.COM. If I go back to the contents, you can see that Foreplate is logging that I've read all this stuff as now there's only 12 unread sections left. But here are your TAFs again, and it's all color coded just like we're looking at the flight categories on the map. And even they will highlight what the necessary times we look at based on your departure. So even though looking at the TAF for Newark looks like there's some IFR, we shouldn't have to worry about that if my departure time is going to be at 8.30. Four flights all calculating that. Um, you've got your different winds and loft charts to take a look at, winds and loft table. So if you were going to do, for some reason, you want to do your manual planning on a paper nav law, you can find your winds and loft data right here based on your altitudes and waypoints before going into all of your necessary notums and also filter out all that stuff. So I'm going to press back, but again, very, very useful to do your uh, weather briefing right here on Four Flight. Um, at the end of this, I do have a couple additional tips to discuss, and one of those will be talking about if this weather briefing will satisfy the FR requirement and everything. But we're going to continue moving on now to the scratch pads tab. So on the right, um, there's a more button, and I can press this to see a bunch of additional tabs. So we're going to take a look at scratch pads. This is mainly just for note taking purposes and you can add a new scratch pad over here. As you can see, I haven't really used this in the last four years or so since I was you know, working on student pod stuff. But what you can do, add a new scratch pad, you can open up different templates. Um, you can open just kind of like a plain uh, piece of paper almost. Craft is another good template if you're copying down a clearance, but one that I've found relatively useful for students is the ATIS template over here. So if you're in the airplane, you want to copy down ATIS, it can be a lot because they're talking fast, a lot of information. You may not be too familiar with the order. You can use this to copy it down as the template is um, graded so that'll follow the order of the readout on you know, the ATIS. Um, so you've got your airport, the information code, if you wanted to write that, uh, the wind, altimeter, expected runway. Of course, you're not going to be copying everything down probably, but at least you know, at a minimum, getting the information code, runway, altimeter, and whatnot there. So that's the scratch pad tab. Um, you can just, again, draw on it with your finger. If you've got like an Apple pencil, you can use that as well there. So I'll clear that out. Uh, the next tab we're going to take a look at that I personally don't use, but I've had a couple of students use this. That's pretty interesting, actually, is the checklist chat checklist tab. Um, should be relatively self-explanatory, but Four Flight actually has preset uh, templates of checklists from different POHs, and you can even make your own checklist. Um, so, for example, I've got one for 38 November over here. It's a 172S. I can actually check it off as I go, which is kind of a nice, cool feature over there. Something else kind of odd. I had one person do this. It was kind of unexpected, but it works. Um, you can actually make Four Flight say this stuff out loud. Uh, there's a speak button over there. If you press the speak button, Four Flight will say each item on your checklist out loud. Um, and it'll just continue proceeding along after you do it. So it's kind of like having your own co-pilot there. Normal procedures, abnormal emergency. Again, all of this stuff is directly coming from POH. But if you wanted to edit it, you could do that as well. So again, checklist is a nice little feature if you didn't want to you know, have um, a separate document on the airplane to use like that. All right, so we've got a logbook tab over here. Um, so good recommendation also it would be to start an electronic logbook, especially if you're going to be doing this for a career. I, I don't personally use this for flight logbook. It's pretty old over here, a lot of old information. Uh, but you can add manually a new entry over here. 
But if you're recording your flight um, using the Maps tab, Forthlow will automatically generate a track log and also an entry in the logbook based on the selected times. But if I wanted to add something in new, for example, just the same way you would do it on a paper uh, logbook, your date, the aircraft, you know, departure, destination, airport, and all your different times, and then it'll you know, automatically add the totals as well, so you don't have to worry about that hassle. Uh, so moving on. Another really cool thing that I'll talk about a little bit here is weight and balance. So definitely important to know how to do weight and balance manually, but ForeFlight has a feature where you can automatically do your weight and balance calculations. And it's gonna be similar to some of the previous functions that we've got to add a specific aircraft profile in order to do the weight and balance. Um, so on the top, got a couple of different airplanes in here, all, all the uh, flight school airplanes. But uh, for example, I can add a new profile. I would have to add a tail number in. So why don't we do um, two Fox Trout Whiskey? So N172 FW, press next. Should know that that's an uh, airplane over there. Uh, we'll stick with normal category flight envelope, press next again. And here's where I would have to enter in the actual data for the airplane, because of course, basic empty weight is gonna be different for each airplane, right? Like Charlie's not gonna be the same as three in November, for example. Uh, we have a sheet at the flight school with all the uh, weights and moments and CGs for each airplane, so you can use that. I'm gonna get out of this and we'll select a specific airplane. So I'll stick with you know Mike Charlie over here. Uh, but there's two parts to this, the load and the setup. We already set everything up, so we have to load the airplane now. So they already know it's 172. There's front seat section, fuel tanks, aft seats, and any baggage area. So you could type in uh, the weights of wherever you want to be in there, remove them if or not, if you wanted to as well, add anything in the baggage area. But based on what I've got selected right now. It looks like the airplane does fall into the normal category envelope and all my weights are within limits on the right side over here. They're telling us what our takeoff weight's going to be, what the max is, what my CG is. So again, a very, very useful feature is to be able to do your weight and balance on four flight. Um, but again, know how to do it manually, but efficiently and quickly. This is obviously the best method over here. Uh, moving along over here is the aircraft tab. We took a look at this kind of uh, stuff beforehand, but this is where you would add an aircraft to the system if you wanted to be using it for following a flight plan um, or for those performance profiles. Next one is custom content though. So if you wanted to maybe put a waypoint over your house, you could find the Latin long, go to user waypoints, press the plus, enter that in. You can name it my house and then if you type in my house in the uh maps tab for your flight plan you can get a direct line to your house so another cool little feature there you can use uh track logs over here we were uh, briefly talking about that before but what you can do to debrief your flight as you fly you can press this uh record button on the left side Oh, I think my iPad keeps crashing over here. Let me get back to that. Um, but there's a setting actually that allows you to automatically start the recording of the flight uh, when the airplane's in the air. Um, and for flight, based on the GPS location, we'll start tracking your altitudes and airspeed and everything. And once you stop it, it'll actually generate um, a track log so you can debrief your flight and see how you did. Um, so again, back to the maps tab, but the recording buttons all the way on the left side over there, you can see how long it's been recording for as well. Uh, let me get back to the track logs over here. I'll scroll down to see if I can find one that is actually working over here, but I usually don't record as it kills the battery pretty quickly, but let's see. Okay, this is 1.0 over here. Not sure what this is. Okay, some pattern work, um, but you can see how you're doing with your pattern, see how you're doing holding your altitude and airspeed and all these different times and everything. Um, so nice tool to debrief and review your flight with an instructor. You can even send this to a um, your email as a KML file. And you can open that up in Google Earth if you wanted to take a look at your uh, flight like that too. Um, and that's pretty much all the tabs there for four flight. The last thing though, uh, what I want to mention is when you download this app and open it up, all of those charts and diagrams are not actually going to be there. You've actually got to download all of this stuff on. So it is going to take some good amount of storage space. To do that, we would go to the download section over here. We're going to be using the United States. You've got to select what types of downloads you want and then the specific regions. So I've selected to download all taxi diagrams and chart supplements, terminal procedures, VFR charts, and so on over there. And then for the regions, I don't have every state, but I've got uh, pretty much whatever's in the Northeast, obviously New Jersey. Uh, and once I select that stuff, I'll go back to the main downloads page and press the download button. 
And then fourth level, start downloading everything onto your device and you'll be able to see your sectional chart and all those um, other cool features. The data does expire every four weeks. So fourth level will notify you that, hey, new set of you know, data is available. So you want to start downloading that again. Um, so it looks like worldwide obstacles data expires on the 27th of January, 2022. So probably a couple of days before that, I would get a notification that the new data is available. And I would start getting that onto the device, just like, you know, if you're up, updating a, a GPS, GPS database there as well. All right. So that's um, what I have for you in terms of the uh, iPad screen sharing of the app itself. But what I want to do to wrap it up is bring myself back to the uh, presentation. I have a couple of additional tips as well um, when you're flying with an iPad. So let me get back to that. All right. So uh, three other slides over here. I guess I can open this up in the slideshow view. All right. So even if it sounds a little silly, you still want to actually pre-flight your iPad before uh, using it on a flight. Um, so a couple of things that you do want to ensure you're doing is making sure you've got all those necessary charts and diagrams downloaded and up to date. So again, that's just like we were talking about using that downloads tab. You don't want to be flying with old information. Uh, also making sure that your iPad is fully charged and if not having some kind of backup battery pack or cables available. I think 3 of November has one of those things where you can plug it in and charge, um, but also carrying backups. So that could mean paper charts. That could mean for flight on an iPhone or a second iPad. Um, right now it's winter, but when we're flying in summer, you're gonna see that when you're using for flight for a while and you're using that iPad, it will overheat pretty often in the airplane. Um, so you do wanna have some kind of backup. So for me personally, I'm primarily using the iPad for flight, but if that overheats or somehow fails, I also have for flight on my uh, phone to use. And if not, I've also got paper charts in my flight bag. Uh, next tip over here, if you do notice that um, while you're using four flight, your iPad uh, battery is draining ridiculously fast, a couple suggestions uh, that could possibly work. Uh, so turning on airplane mode and also um, turning off your display when you're not actually using it. So for example, if I'm doing a cross country, I'm not going to have my iPad display on the whole time in cruising, definitely during maybe the descent and landing, for example. No? Um, I could also lower the brightness if I needed to, you know, making sure you have a clean screen. Sometimes, and I've heard that the uh, track log and breadcrumbs can actually increase the battery usage. So you can turn those off, you don't need it. But of course, as I mentioned before, try to always have some kind of portable um, backup battery charger so you can charge it in flight. I also get a lot of questions about what kind of device, what kind of iPad do I need to operate uh, for flight on? So I would recommend, and ForeFlight has a little page explaining all this stuff, but um, I would recommend getting an iPad with the cellular option. Don't have to activate it or anything, but you do want to have an iPad with cellular. The reason being, the cellular option comes with an internal GPS unit, um, which you can use to find your location as you fly. But if you have an iPad only with the Wi-Fi, you've got to connect it to some kind of external unit to find GPS location in flight. So a couple of popular options would be um, the Stratus or Sentry unit. So let me just show you what that uh, looks like over here. So I'll open up the Sentry. Definitely a well, pricey unit, but I just, you know, it's a window mounted uh, thing I just put in the back over there. So not only would this give me my GPS location, Sentry would also give me ADSB uh, traffic so I can see where everybody else is. I've also got my weather over there and also carbon monoxide detecting. So I would definitely, definitely recommend um, getting one of these kind of units, a Sentry or a Stratus over there. All right, so a couple other things over here. You may notice if you try to fly with an iPad and you don't have any way to secure it, it's gonna be a pain in the ass. Um, it's gonna be sliding everywhere around the cockpit and you're gonna have a hard time getting it. So you do wanna to try to use some kind of knee board or a yoke or window mount. Um, you can find all of those in any one of those flying stores. So I was just looking at sporties before. Um, so personally though, I like to use a knee board when I'm flying a VFR. So again, I keep my iPad and a notepad on each side over there. But when I'm flying IFR, I'll actually tend to use a window mount. So I'll actually mount the, um, if I'm flying left seat, at least I'll mount the iPad on the window just to the left uh, of where I'm sitting. So kind of on the, I guess, 45 to the left of where I'm sitting. So that way I can kind of incorporate my iPad into my instrument scan. So I don't have to spend time constantly looking down at my iPad, you know, plugging something in, getting distracted, not scanning my instruments over there. Something else that's uh, pretty important over here. So we were talking about this graphical weather briefing in that um, flights tab before. So 
this can be used to satisfy the weather and NOTAMs requirement in your FARs. That's 91103, all those pre-flight action requirements. This is, hey, you've got to check NOTAMs, the weather, no ATC delays, runway lights, and so forth. You are totally allowed to use for flight to check the, you know, the weather and NOTAMs. Um, as I mentioned before, all of the content is derived from approved government sources. It's all from Aviation Weather Center there. Additionally, when you press the briefing and you read through it, for flight it has a timestamp and stores that in the cloud. Um, so it's on the record if you, you're looking at it like that. Additionally, um, the FAA pretty recently released an advisory circular kind of on this concept. And this is directly from that advisory circular. They say that they consider that a self-briefing may be compliant with current FARs. By self-briefing, pilots can often improve their knowledge of weather and aeronautical information. Flight service personnel are available should a pilot need assistance. So it's definitely kind of interesting to read that. Um, but after looking at a lot of different videos and reading other sources about it, they're just basically telling us, um, call us if you need it, but definitely they're encouraging us now, you know, soft briefing using for flight, for example, can be a way to go. Um, another alternative is 1-800-WXBrief.com. Same thing, you can follow a flight plan on there, do the briefing, even save it as a PDF, get it to your email just so you can do it on for flight. Um, but overall, the answer to this, yes, you can use for flight for, um, getting the weather and NOTAMs to satisfy the FR requirements. And the last uh, tip I've got over here, this is more for uh, student pods over here. Um, I also have a lot of questions about, are we allowed to use for flight on a check ride? And if not, what's going to happen and all that. So it is totally okay to use on a check ride. Um, they've got something in the ACS explaining that examiners have to allow use of EFBs. Um, but likely what's going to happen is that the DP will have you turn off specific settings, such as the location services that you can't see exactly where you are on the, on, you know, the map uh, tab. So basically, it's just acting like a paper chart. And this is probably going to be the case when you're doing your pilotage, dead reckoning, and diversion task. So on your, your check ride, you know you're going to be planning across country, and the flight will be you fly up to your first uh, checkpoint, then you do the diversion. Uh, that stuff, you're not going to really be able to use, again, your GPS location. They've got to be able to see that. Okay, you can look outside and use your nav log to figure out where you are and get to different places. Um, you still want to be carrying some kind of paper chart as a backup because the GPA may simulate an iPad or GPS failure. Um, and addition, you should be able to use for a flight for a bunch of different features, including obtaining the weather before and during a flight. So again, we looked at the airport tab, we looked at the flights tab for a briefing. And also um, when the DPA simulates some kind of loss scenario, you also should be able to find your frequencies using for a flight. All right, so that's pretty much all I've got for you guys. Um, for the fundamentals of for flight. So what I'll do, I'll open up to uh, questions over here. Let me see if I can get that all set up. All right, if you guys want to type it in in the chat or unmute yourself, that'll work. Let me get my video back on as well. All right, very good. That was a good briefing, Wesley. But congrats. I, I Thank learned, you. I learned a bunch appreciate of stuff. Appreciate it. I haven't been, uh, haven't been paying attention to. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. That was helpful. Uh, do you have this as a podcast? We can uh, double check. It's plenty of information in such a short time. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is going to be a lot of stuff. Um, I believe Ken Greenberg is going to edit this and upload it as a YouTube video, maybe a podcast. I'm not sure, but it will be available on the Princeton Airport and Flying School website for further review. I'm also going to share the uh, PowerPoint presentation and all that. So there'll be a link to that. Okay. Thanks. You got it. All right. I got a good question over here from Christopher Berry. He asked, uh, if you have an electronic logbook with another program, can you import that logbook into ForeFlight or do you have to simply retype it all? Thanks. And he's giving an example of Zulu Log. I had this exact same problem a couple months ago, which is when I opened up that uh, logbook tab, you saw a lot of entries in there, but it stopped at a current date. I have not decided to update my um logbook on for flight so i guess using zulu log so i use um my flight book just another free alternative for an electronic logbook so i was able to do it um by exporting something into uh, an excel document chaining rounds and columns and labeling some stuff it did take some time um so i'm not sure how compatible it's going to be but i would have to take a further look if zulu log can export a specific template 
but most of those electronic logbooks you can export into at least an Excel file and then rearrange some things because Forflight does have their own little specific um, template, I guess you could call it. Another option is if you wanted to do so is at least just create one entry per aircraft and enter in the total times for each. I've seen people do that as well. Yeah. Let me ask you, what's the advantage of having a digital logbook instead of a paper logbook? You know, because of my age, I probably still prefer a paper logbook. You know, it's it's easier to to flip through the pages, double check. I don't see the advantage. Yeah, it's a very good question. So, so personally, um, the electronic logbook I think is a good backup in case I lose uh, my paper logbook or somehow that gets destroyed. Um, additionally, it'll automatically do all the totaling for me, so I don't have to worry about uh, checking each page. But I like to keep both. So I do both um, the paper logbook and electronic. So I'll do my electronic first. And then as I'm doing my paper logbook, I will double check with my electronic one just to make sure I haven't entered anything wrong before I do the totals, for example. OK. All right. Anita says, can't wait to be able to come back to the US in the future and fly again. Very useful information. It looks simple enough. There are heaps, loads of tabs and options. Quite useful to do it on the ground and get confidence up first. 100% agree. Um, it is, the airplane is not the right place to learn for a flight. You got to spend uh, at least an hour or so on the ground to figure out what's going on first. And then definitely some time in the airplane to use it. Uh, but definitely get familiar with it uh, on the ground first. All right. Biat is asking Are there alternative programs like ForeFlight? There are. Um, so I personally don't use any, but I know another popular one is Garmin Pilot. So if anybody else has experience with maybe alternative programs, um, we can talk about that too. But personally, I don't use uh, Garmin Pilot. I was going to ask you about FlyQ. I actually subscribe to FlyQ, but it's just on an iPhone, and so it's really not useful for navigation. Gotcha. Yeah. So, John, I mean, I personally don't use that, but you brought up a good point, actually, the, the iPhone. Um, so for flight, I also have that installed on my iPhone. Um, let me actually show you guys what that looks like. I think I'm able to share my screen. Just give me one second. All right. So I think this should work. OK, so. Here's what it looks like on an iPhone. I mean, it's all the same information. It is more compact and a little bit more cluttered. So I would definitely definitely prefer to use it on an iPad, but it is doable. Um, again, based on how big your screen size too, I have a pretty small iPhone, so it's not, not the most practical. All right, yeah. One, one, thing, one thing that I do is I, uh, people that have the Garmin, you know, the, G, the GNS for whatever the latest navigators are, uh, from ForeFlight, if you use it on the web, you can export your flight plan to a, uh, to a flight plan data card, Garmin units import that flight plane into your navigator. So if you have your own airplane, you have your own, you know, GNS, you know, 430, 530, whatever the latest versions are, and actually build the flight plan on four flight. You can export it or you can plug it into your GPS and load it into your GPS. All right. I didn't know that myself too. So very, very, very useful feature there. Awesome. Awesome. Plus three on the card, but you know <laughs> it's easy. Gotcha. All right, a couple more questions here. So Christopher's asking, can you easily easily share aircraft profiles between people? Um, honestly, I'm not 100% sure. I never actually thought about that. Um, let me take a look. I don't know if anyone else knows, but let's see here. I'm going to go back to the aircraft. So as of now, I don't see anything with uh, an option to share. Um, but when you do type in like the tail number, it'll, it should recognize the airplane and everything. Uh, but if you have like a more advanced subscription, and I'm going to talk about that next, actually, um, the performance profiles will actually have presets. So you don't, you wouldn't have to enter in all that stuff manually. So you, there'd be preset options, maybe 2,400 RPM cruise and whatever, you know, fuel burn. So that could be an option there, but I don't think that you can maybe send the aircraft profile around. I've got to take a look though myself to get like a, a certain answer there. All right, and we had asked, what are the costs of Fort Flight? Okay, so I'm gonna pull up the uh, link to their subscription and pricing and everything. We're gonna send that in the main chat over here. All right, they have three different options over here, uh, Basic Plus, Pro Plus, and Performance Plus. So private pod VFR stuff, 
you're going to be totally fine for with the basic plus um but instrument and so on i would probably recommend getting one of the higher ones um one of the cool features about at least the pro plus is that you have geo referenced approaches and charts so it'll actually show your instrument approach plates and taxiway diagrams on the map view as you taxi so that can be kind of cool there um but 99 dollars a year or 100 a year is at least what they charge for the basic plus uh pro plus is 199 and performance plus is 299 over there but all the information about what exactly they have in each plan is going to be in that four flight pricing link for your purpose tonight when you had these sample uh demonstrations which one did you use because i used my ipad it looks slightly different than what you had on the screen there so i was wondering if you have a pro plus or the performance plus it's a good question so i i only use the basic plus so i have the lowest options so i i don't pay for the uh to your reference plates and everything else, but maybe some of the screenshots I had on the uh, PowerPoint, but I think, again, everything should be part of that basic plus feature. Most of it were, yeah. Just the pro, I have the pro plus, and it's, I have pro plus and it's very useful for IFR, especially with the, uh, the synthetic vision. Yes, yeah, definitely useful tool as well. All right, um, so Andrew's asked, you mentioned TFRs would be in the maps view. Do TFRs get updated while in flight with a Sentry or Stratus connected? Okay, so that's a pretty good question there as well. So, I mean, as long as the connection is there, it should be updated because I can also receive um, like new METARs and TAFs in the air as well as they go. So that should, again, it'll show up on the map screen. It'll tell you as you get closer as well. So it should be updated. All right, and then Niran asked, uh, let's see. He said, great session, very informative. I use it regularly to check weather before my lessons. Awesome. I am still far from needing four flight in the plane, but I use it with a simulator at home. Awesome. Okay. I actually didn't expect anyone to bring that up. But if um, I'm not sure if, if, if FSX, but X plane, which is the, um, what we use in the sim at the airport, you can actually hook up four flight to the sim and fly approaches along and it'll show your airplane on the map and everything. And it could be useful for some kind of VFR purpose too. But yeah, you can you can hook up for flight to the sim. Very, very useful feature there as well. It's awesome that you're doing that. All right, does anybody else uh, have any questions here? Let's see. Very welcome, Christopher. Thank you very much for coming. He was very Thank good. You, John. Good seeing you again. It'd be good to be flying soon, right? Thank you. Of course, you got it. Pretty good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you Appreciate it, guys. Of course, have a great night. Thank you. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you guys. very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Hope you enjoyed. We'll see you soon. Hope you care. Okay. Yep. Late night for me. So good night, guys. <laughs> have a great night. Take care. Thanks. Wes, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you it. You got it, Jack. Thank you very much. You, Glad to uh, do it. We'll see you soon. You got it. I think I have a couple flights tomorrow morning, but probably not going to happen. I'll take another look at the tap for it. Let's see. Yeah, I, I don't think it's looking uh, too hot for tomorrow. <laughs> All right, I see. It's snow in the forecast, if I'm not mistaken. All right. All right too bad. But right. but we'll, we'll call it in the morning. You got it. Yeah, I'll let you know. All right, cool, man. Have a good night. We'll All right, you. thank you very much. Have a good night.